adhere to one course or, own, or, or not. In another. Okay, let's take two more comments or questions and then I'm going to move on a little. Okay, mine's more of a comment, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that I'm a recent graduate and also been in um, into, into lecturing and research in Sydney. Okay. So I think that um, and because I have that very close um, approximation to being a student and also lecturing, I've noticed that some, the, the, the way that we assess really needs to change. So the weighting that we place on these end of course examinations need to change because a whole lot of anxiety is placed on the student at that moment also. And it's also based on me. So we need to have some form of continuous assessment that actually counts because at the end of the day the student goes, but this doesn't count as a weighting in my in my course. So why should I do that? So the, the, the distribution of, of weighting with all these different types of assessments needs to be compiled within that course outline. Yeah, and talked about. And that's why it's made explicit. Discussed with me, not necessarily always negotiated with, but at least, at least discussed with students that there's a clear sense of the purpose of these things. I know that there will be concerns for some people around things like uh, identity, you know, who gets to do the assessment then, you know, if, if it's a group assessment, who puts all the effort into the group assessment and so on. We've got to be wary of those kinds of things and those are steps in the process. But that for me doesn't preclude our, our attention to why we do this and our and, um, and a debate about how much of this course can be formative in terms of its orientation and how much of it can be summative. Again, we place too much emphasis on that summative snapshot view, I think. It, has, it carries high stakes purposes and we make very high stakes claims on very thin evidence of that. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank you so much for such an uh, informative online assessment because I've been critical of it because I... Uh, You've been uh, critical? Uh, yes. Yeah, good. <laughs> I'm no, sorry, may I just... I'm no online assessment evangelist, please. I haven't come in with a, with a flag waving for online assessment. In fact, I've thought about it very carefully, but I'm trying to say what are, the, what are its affordances and what are its drawbacks. Sorry, I'm... Okay. I've been critical of it with me. I find it... I'm teaching in first year lesson yeah. students. When you look at those focuses, especially the affective, cognitive, and mm -hmm. behavioral, normally we, 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 we teach them, they are learning on integrating theory and practice. Yes. And it's first year, and it's a human life discipline. It's a life and death discipline. So you find that you need, you need the affective and the behavioral to come up mm -hmm. on the theory, on your assessment. And it doesn't appear. And uh, <coughs> with the first year, you find that you need to emphasize on that because it's a foundation for them to move forward. But once you do it online, you find that it doesn't come out and it doesn't have enough space to evaluate or to assess how it's coming out from the student themselves. Or they, do they grapple or do they understand what you are saying to them? Okay, I can't, I'm not going to respond specifically without knowing more about what you're actually doing and how you're going about it. I would suspect that partly what it's about is looking at the form of assessment. So, so for me, making big judgments about behavior really doesn't, isn't going to emerge, and I'm not suggesting you do, isn't going to emerge out of a text-based um, assessment practice, for example, which many of my colleagues and I in the past and even in the present do mistakenly. So we think that if students write an analytical essay, that tells us something about how they might behave. So we've got to find an appropriate form of assessment. And I think, again, the online space could do that. We could have them. You know, they could do a video recording. They could, they, could do a, they could record a group process. They could, But they need support, and they need rubrics, and they need uh, feedback about what they're doing and how they're doing it, and the alignment between the purpose and the task. Um, these things, that's what constructive alignment I think is telling us. We need a lot more talk about, discussion about, and thinking through what those alignments are. And again, back to my third point here, the claims we make on the basis of those alignments. <coughs> so it's, it needs an interrogation of what, and, and not necessarily only one kind of assessment, a range of assessment activities that together enable us to make a better claim on the cognitive, behavioral, affective values type levels. It's, it's not, it, 
it's, we can't be prescriptive here. What, what I'm in trying to encourage in the discussion here is thinking about what we're doing and how we're doing it and whether it's the best way to do it. And therefore, what the online space allows us and what the face-to-face -face space does. And conversely, what the online space constrains. The literacy issue is an important issue in that, that I mentioned earlier. For some students, engagement in an online space is really difficult, troublesome, and demands a different kind of engagement to that that is, in, that is done um, in the face-to-face -face space. But it does allow us to have, I think, greater access into what student, how students are participating. Are there students in the room today? Or is it all academics or lecturers and tutors and like, okay. I don't want to set up a thing about students versus, you know, me versus they. You know. Okay, so just a few more points about alignment and then looking at the online space. And I'm going to try and leave a good, good amount of time for, for discussion. <clears throat> the typologic, typology theory, I think, helps us to be really quite self-conscious and deliberate about how we plan assessment. Back to my point about making assessment part of the discourse of the discipline. So you, so that there, the onus, the, the onus is on us, onus on us, um, to make sure that we that we achieve the purposes we really want to achieve with assessment. And what I'm suggesting through this kind of scheme here, and it's, please, this is just an example, and it's just a kind of, it's not a lattice, it's not meant to be taken exactly as is. But if we can think about assessment both in the online and the face-to-face -face space, if we can think about assessment as about the relationship between what we're trying to assess, uh, sorry, what we're trying to assess, the kind of content or the, or the focus of our assessment, and the kind of demand we might be placing on students in that space. Why I think this is particularly useful is this might serve a real function at the whole curriculum level, or the first year student level, for example. We could arguably plot our assessment activity, formative and summative, on this kind of map and where, where we could see, for example, the extent to which what we're doing is aligned from purpose to student learning to what we wanted to claim about that learning. So we could, we could say, for example, at the first year level, the primary assessment demand at first year level, I'm just assuming here, might be recall and application. So we would expect our formative and summative tasks to be placed most predominantly in those spaces. We would less expect to be asking students to review or critique or evaluate. So I just want to be careful here because we don't want to sort of make it or essentialize it to be that first year student learning is all about recall and application and it's only when you get to third or fourth year that you do any review and critique. It's going to change according to disciplines. But what I'm suggesting is if we're thinking about the demand we're placing on students in relation to the kinds of things that we expect them to do, then we can kind of plot and we can use the online space to develop some of these competencies or some of these abilities for students. So if we know, for example, that we don't want examinations or summative assessment to be strongly recall focused, we can use the formative online, for example, space to do the recall activity and use the, the summative space to do more and more, if you like, complex or multi-dimensional kinds of assessment. But, but knowing what it is we're trying to do and knowing what it looks like in each of our disciplines, which obviously will be different across all the range of people represented in the room, is really important. What does application mean in the context of my discipline, which is assessment and evaluation? How will I set an, a test or a task or an assessment assignment that will best represent that? Do I want students, for example, to, to only be thinking about application? In my case, clearly not. I want them to be able to integrate the theory into a real-life practice context. So I might not even want them to do any writing at all. Because, and to come back to your one of your earlier questions, ma'am, the, the question about how does this relate to, say, for example, the development of academic writing? Again, if we're going to set a task that is writing dependent or writing heavy, we need to be mediating the writing part of the task as well as the content part of the task. And their alignment, again, is really critical. So in an online space, we might be able to mediate some of that writing, the, the writing element in a highly developmental way, allowing students to do drafts of their writing online, 
perhaps writing them under the, for the introduction to an assignment online, giving them feedback, letting their peers give them feedback, etc., in a highly developmental kind of space that is contributing to the improvement of their ability to write um, in, a, in, the, in the final, say, summative assessment uh, place. Okay, so I'll leave that as an example and, and just suggesting that the usefulness of such a scheme is, first of all, it brings into a real conscious awareness of what we're trying to do in the assessment space, and then I think it also helps us to understand the kind of interplay between the demand we're placing on students and what we want in terms of the discipline, so that bringing those things into some kind of alignment and so on. But it can also help us with a kind of a planning stage around assessment activity too. Okay. So here are some of the things that I think we need to think about when we move into an online space in the assessment, uh, in assessment terms. I've raised some of these issues already. What do we want to assess? Are we assessing content? Are we assessing process? Is it, content? Is it predominantly a conceptual thing that we're trying to assess? The tasks would be different according to those different purposes, in my view. Of course, they will sometimes be integrated. Then there's the alignment issue. How do the assessment activities align with the course objectives and so on? And we're not, we're not called upon as academics to give, if you like, give account of this, but I think it can help us to be much clearer, clearer about the assessment at all. What signals, yeah, that this is the weighting issue. What signals do assessments provide about the course, about the course and to students? So clearly, highly savvy students are going to look at the mark allocation and assessment activity and say, I need to spend more time on, the, on these components because they carry weightings of, say, 25%, or they, are, they count 50 or 70% of the mark in the examination. Clearly, they're going to pay much more attention to that. What is the consequence of that? Is that what we want? Why do we weight things? What, what does the weighting tell the student? What does the weighting tell us about the value and importance of that particular assignment? And then I think really critically, and this comes back to my last my example about the written exam at the end of the course, what form of assessment is best suited to the purpose, the learning purpose that we want? <clears throat> the, the written essay clearly carries huge currency in the higher education environment. It's also really, it's, it's also really useful because it can be done at mass scale, for example, and so on and so on and so on. But it may not be the best form of assessment that we, that we use. Um, I'm not sure. We, we can probably talk about that further as we go along. Okay, let's pause there for a second if there are any more questions or comments or observations people want to make. And then I'm going to move into the online space directly. Yes, ma'am. I mean, yeah, I, th I think if we're going to practice formative assessment and it's not going to be for marks, then, yeah, then it, it requires, I suppose, some kind of discussion and debate among <coughs> colleagues about what, what it's going to look like. Um, my, my immediate reaction to that is to say it doesn't matter, but it will matter at some point, because at some point someone will want to give account of the formative activity that they've, they've, they've introduced in a particular course. So it will matter. So at minimum, it... It's back to this kind of self-conscious stuff. So why am I doing this formative assessment? What are its different purposes? What roles does it play? Why am I not giving it marks? And that can be documented, and I think it should be documented. Not in an overly kind of prescriptive and rigorous, I mean, restrictive kind of way, but in a way that says this contributes to the impact of the course as a whole. So maybe that's where quality and quality assurance starts to play a role. The, the kind of self-conscious documentation the contribution this makes to staff development in, in the institution and so on. But it's very difficult to, to say there's one kind of prescript that fits the whole institution. It will depend on, uh, it, it depends on, on disciplines and academics. But, uh, but yeah, that, it's not only dependent on academics individually because then it's going to be a, a, a kind of an idiosyncratic or very discipline specific thing. So there's a, there's a role I think quality assurance can play in contributing to staff perceptions of best practice, for example. That's a real role that, that QA can play. What does it mean to do formative assessment? What, is the, what are the best ways in which formative assessment can be practiced? 
but it takes the discipline as well. People will need to engage with these things in the discipline or the sub discipline. Right. Um, I have a practical uh, yeah. Okay, just remind me what OSCE stand for. <coughs> Occupation specific. So what's the acronym stand for? Okay, objective setting in the clinical yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay, and the, the most um, immediate that comes to my mind is making sure that that is recorded and placed online. So both the, both the assessment activity and the practice, and I would say also uh, ensuring that the feedback given to students in that environment is part of the recording, so that students can view it again. Beyond that, I would mediate, I would look to mediate that by saying, what did you notice in these different cases? Place, here are the scenarios, have a look at these different examples and what did you notice in those spaces. You'd need to be careful though, I suppose about the formal thing because if that's a formal examination against a professional standard, you'd need to think about the ethics of recording and, and who gets to see that recording, but it can be used I think very strongly in that way as one example. I must say, I've started the process yeah. online. Yeah. It's been really um, warm yeah. in terms of person power, yeah. cost, and time. Yeah. Sure. And in terms of technology, but also in terms of students downloading as well as they go, school breaks up, like, what is UCT or oh. experience going around? Yeah, no, it's great. We, this is a process. I, I, we can't move to this you know, from naught to 100 in, in, in one move. So I would suggest start small, see where it is possible to do this kind of thing. Maybe just do one recording as a learning example that can be placed online. Make sure, for example, that when students view it, they can view it in a place where, where data is available to them. I mean, they, not, no, not set up an expectation that they're going to do it, for example, at home, where they, where they may not be able to find that example. Do it, work it in class if necessary. I mean, I can see good examples of that, of that discussion happening in a lecture room itself, so that there is bandwidth and there is an opportunity for students to engage. But not to move, in my view, not to move from, as I say, 0 to 100 in one step. You may, you, it may only be practicable in one example, and that's going to take you know, it's 20 hours of engagement and work to get that single example up there. But that's a start. The nice thing about that is it's an archive. It's not going to go away. It will be usable the following year, too, and reusable. With difficulty. I'm not a, like I said, I, this is not an easy approach. I'm, I'm, my, my view here, okay, it's born out of practice as well, but it's lar largely also aspirational and idealistic. I think this is important. I think this is how we should be thinking about assessment, but it's not going to happen overnight. It probably takes engagement and intervention at all the layers and levels of the institution. So you need champions in the institution. You need individual practitioners who are going to do this and model this behavior. You need the deans, for example. Are there any deans here today? No? Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Deans, I'm talking directly to you. <laughs> you need the deans to support this, to give a signal that this is important work, to, to, to also give a signal that there are resources that can be provided for this important work, so that it's not just the responsibility of the individual academic to toil away developing these resources, but that there's some signal. 
the DVC teaching and learning. You know, at, at every level, there needs to be some kind of important signal that says this is both useful work, important work, theoretically desirable work, good practice, supported in other cases, but also problematic. We, again, we've got to think about what are the problems and the difficulties too. But it needs that kind of engagement. It's, not, it's, it, it's, you, it's nice when individuals take up these courses and work with them at the individual level, but many of those individuals burn out because they say, well, you know, I'm just doing this in a complete vacuum. Nobody's supporting me. I've produced this incredibly useful resource about you know, occupational therapy assessment in a laboratory setting, and, and who cares? You know, nobody's supporting that. Nobody's, I'm not getting any kind of recognition for it. I might as well just continue my basic talk and talk mechanisms. I need to see other. Okay, sorry. Two more questions, and then I'm going to move on again. Can I just add? Yeah. So the intention should not be to change yeah. uh, the conceptions or sure. the, the perspectives, but to broaden the chronic perspectives. Fantastic. Yes, present these as possibilities <laughs> and opportunities. Do not present them as, you know, you're not doing this, so you better start doing it kind of stuff. Because that's, yeah, absolutely. I think myself, I just want to make a comment. Uh, when you talk about something being driven from the top. Yes. But it can happen the other way yes. too. It's yes. about you doing what you believe would yes. work and present whatever it is yeah. that you're doing. And those that are receptive, ideas grow. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I've been in higher education long enough to know that iteration and reiteration are really important. You say the same thing many times over. People start getting tired of hearing the message. But somewhere along the line, perhaps there's a kind of an uptake or a receptivity to that message. And then, but it, 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 it requires resilience, it requires energy, it requires um, persistence to get there. Okay, I'm going to move on yeah, a little bit into the, directly into the online space here. And then I'm going to say, let's have 20 minutes or more, perhaps, at the end for proper discussion and commentary and so on. And maybe even aware too, you know, what does this mean beyond this two-hour conversation, which is on record. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what am I talking about in online space terms? And I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. What's the length of a piece of string? You could, you could, you could go. There are so many possibilities in the online space for engagement that has that can ba have both a strongly formative and summative purpose in assessment terms. And please, I want somebody to raise the question with us and discuss with us the question about, so what happens when you do place high-stakes assessment into an online space in relation to things like standards, security, and whether people can copy one another's work. We do need to talk about that stuff, because it sits here as an important question. You can't just say, well, you know, students are so good, they're not going to try and, you know, cheat the system or whatever. We do need to talk about that. So it could be any of these things, it could be all or more. And other here could be things like social media. Um, I know I have tried unsuccessfully so far in the postgraduate space to use social media for students to discuss issues that arise out of my lectures. They're too conservative, apparently. I'm talking about adult students in my particular context. It's also my fault because what I did was I simply put a task in, in, a, in, a, in, an, um, in a social media space and, and expected that a week later students would have responded in great depth to the questions I was asking them about the assessment activity. They didn't. And my fault, mea culpa, was I didn't follow up. I didn't provide a sort of sequenced, scaffolded, intentional intervention where on day two I said to students, boy, I noticed nobody's responded to my questions. Are there, is there something wrong here? What's going on? You know, there, there needs to be some kind of intervention and monitoring of those online processes. We can't necessarily, what I learned was, I can't necessarily just say, well, students have never done this before, now suddenly they're going to be immediately drawn to an online activity and just do it. Even postgraduate, even adult students in this particular case. <laughs> they were still waiting for me to say, what's in 